So now I would like to transition into the next segment, segment of our program, where I will moderate a dynamic, I hope, uh, discussion between city leaders, representatives uh, for the NGO community and civil society. Um, the discussion will be about key ways we can mobilize resources and build a resilient future for all people everywhere. So please join me in welcoming to the stage Cassia Moraes, founder and CEO of Youth, Youth Climate Leaders. So Cassie. And Marty Walsh, Mayor of Boston. Sheila Patel, Founder, Director, Society for Promotion of Area Resource Centers, SPARC. And Saki Mohammed, Minister of State, Ministry of Manpower, Ministry of National Development, Singapore. So, I think I'll start with you, uh, Marty. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, Boston has experienced severe snowstorms in January and the hottest weekends ever recorded. Uh, um, and uh, you had coastal flooding in 2018. And uh, when all these things happened, you actually already had a strategy called Climate, climate Ready Boston. Yeah. Um, so, what is Boston now doing to prepare the citizens for uh, the changing climate and uh, how have these events affected your, your goals and your ability to galvanize your community to prepare for these climate uh, impacts? Well, thank you. Uh, the, the fir first of all, I think the fact that uh, we're getting those storms are, are the same uh, responses that people in Greenland had with, with their survey they did. Um, we had a conversation over lunch and we were talking about uh, not everyone is quite in the same space as the 2,000 of us here in Copenhagen today talking about uh, the mm -hmm. climate and, and, and the changes that we're seeing. Uh, and as you mentioned, we have had, we've seen the hottest summers on record. We've seen the coldest winters on record. Uh, we're seeing all kinds of different things happening in the past. You know, we were prepared for, for those types of storms that came. Going forward, I think a couple things have to happen. And one of the things that we're doing now is we're planning out different areas of the city of Boston. We've broken uh, the city of Boston into different neighborhoods. Uh, and we're having these planning conversations uh, in the different neighborhoods about what the impacts of sea level rise might be. And we, we're using really sea level rise as an opportunity because we're a coastal town. We have 47 miles of coastline. And, and being able to point to certain times where the sea has come in where the ocean has come into the different neighborhoods. And I think one is going to be educating people about it and also really making sure that we have those plans moving forward. That's, that, those are a couple of things that, that we've been working on. But, but also, um, we're looking at building out more parks uh, in different spaces in our city uh, so that we can make sure that, that areas stay cooler mm -hmm. and there's places to go where we don't have, where, we're not, where you're not on the coast. And, and it really is going to come down to education. I, I think it is. I mean, I think we saw, I saw in Boston uh, a couple weeks ago where young people, 7,000 of them, um, and to your credit, the young people are stepping up here in the world uh, to really put this on, on the front page and the front burner. And I think we have to do more to educate our people. And while we're doing that is continue to be resilient, continue to build out a plan. Uh, we have a, which I'm sure I'll talk about a little bit longer, but we have 47 miles around the coast, obviously in Boston, one of the oldest cities in America. Uh, and we have a plan called Resilient Boston Harbor uh, that, that actually protects um, the, the coastline, uh, and more importantly, the people that live in that area, the people that work in that area, and also connects people back to the harbor, which we'll talk about later. So you think that basic knowledge is the foundation you have to build the resilient city on? No, knowledge is important, but also having real strong plans yeah. and having real strong people. Yeah. And we have, a, we have an office, uh, actually a whole cabinet inside City Hall in Boston, the environment cabinet, uh, that, that we work on this all day long. And, and it's not just one simple solution. Uh, it's, it's reducing carbon emissions, yeah. getting zero net buildings built, uh, you know, leading the way in the city. There's a whole host of, of different issues that's been talked about today that we're doing in the city. So, so it is engaging literally almost every aspect of life, every aspect of whether it's a, a private person, the private sector, or P uh, public buildings, plans, and resilience, resilient plans, building it into everything that we do in government. And now let's turn to Singapore. 
uh, Sir Saki, what is the biggest climate tra threat facing Singapore today, and uh, how has this uh, influenced the kind of adaptation and resilience projects that the government is investing in in, in, in your city? Well, most people, when you look at Singapore, think of us as an urban city with uh, tall buildings and very developed net public, public transport networks. But the reality is this, um, we are not immune to climate change. And in fact, for us, surprising to most, it's an existential issue. Because being a small city-state, low-lying island, uh, you'd expect that if sea level rises, you may have you know, whole Singapore submerged and there's no more Singapore to talk about in years to come. So if you look at the IPCC report, um, if you predict a sea level rise of about one meter in the next 100 years, it means in 2100, the impact to Singapore could be tremendous because 30% of our land are in low-lying areas. And for us, a one meter increase in sea levels, if you include high water tides, surges, rainfall, um, you will find that uh, there is that risk that many, most, many parts of Singapore could go underwater. At the same time as well, um, if you look at how we structure our water supply, we do have water reservoirs and we have seawater into our reservoirs that said you have um, you, know, you, will, you, you, will, you will lose your water supply too. So to us, it's an existential issue that even the Prime Minister spent one-third of his national day speech on uh, climate adaptation to look at how Singapore needs to uh, plan ahead and put in place measures such as coastal protection, um, look at critical infrastructure and how we plan um, future developments such as airports, ports and so forth to be higher and above sea level to plan for the next 100 years. So we have a 2100 uh, um, plan, so we hope and we, we are putting in place a big budget of about $100 billion to, to put adaptation measures in place. And the plans for, for preparing Singapore for climate change, do they also reach into the greater uh, region? Because Singapore is obviously a very major city in, in a broad region uh, that also are facing uh, severe problems with climate change. I think one of the things that we could do, because in, in terms of um, looking, after ex uh, looking after our existence, is really research and development to some of these areas, because these are not well understood in terms of the impact of rain, water level tides into coastal cities. And um, our, we hope that our experience and our research could go into learnings for others to also adapt. At the same time, I think it's great that you have platforms such as the C40, where cities with similar concerns could uh, work together to see how best we can implement. I mean, for us, we estimated that this is going to be the cost, but you never know how fast or slow the water levels will rise. But this is our estimate at this point in time, and things could always change. Yeah, I think uh, when we talk about the cities, uh, we oftentimes think about what we all see all the time. But of course, the cities, uh, as we all know, consist of many different uh, uh, communities and different social situations. So, so I think for both of you, uh, how would you ensure that the people who are usually most uh, susceptible to all these problems, uh, the, the, the poor, the elderly, and, and so forth, that they uh, are being taken especially care of in, in, in these climate adaptation uh, uh, strategies? I think it's important to to have them part of the have people part of the conversation, and we are particularly elderly, yeah. uh, people of color, uh, lower income folks, uh, and, and also when we when we're building out some of the parks that we're doing and the different investments we're making, uh, it, it, some of that goes towards the most vulnerable people as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can't ignore you can't you, you, we shouldn't ignore mm -hmm. those th people like that. Mm -hmm. I'll give an example in Boston, Roseanne Boston Harbor, one of the one of the areas. Uh, or two of the areas that Resilient Boston Harbor protects is we have uh, one of the largest housing developments for poor people in the city of Boston in South Boston. It's called the Mary Ellen McCormick Housing Development. And we have a plan to build out uh, a berm on the, on the, in the South Boston waterfront um, to prevent the water from going in through a park mm -hmm. into this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. On the other side of the city, we have what's called the Four Point Channel. It's kind of the the growing area in the city of Boston, if you will, um, down by Procter and Gamble and Gillette, mm -hmm. it has a big, big footprint there, and we're building uh, we're building pro um, berms and seawalls there mm -hmm. as well. Or we're going to be building them in our plan. If if we don't do anything, those two bodies of water meet. Yeah. When those two bodies of water meet, they go into the Mary Ellen McCormick Housing Development. 
They go into the old, with another housing development across the street, the old colony housing development. And then it goes, runs down into Roxbury, the South End, uh, parts of predominantly people of color areas that we have in the city of Boston. And, and a lot of, and people that, that are most vulnerable goes into those areas. So when we think about, when we think about protecting the city, you have to think that way. But also I think it's important to have those folks sitting at the table having conversations with us as well. Mm. Exactly. Well, for us, I think in terms of the vulnerable, um, our, we are a bit fortunate in the sense that 80% of the population from the lowest income to the upper middle income live in public housing. So to some extent, we do have control in terms of how we plan the estates, plan the, where people live, and therefore we are able to influence that. But where we need to work a lot harder are areas in which we will have um, self, I mean, existential issues. So. One aspect, as I mentioned, coastal protection. So today, um, the fact that you know, the Prime Minister spent one third of his speech on this, I think raised the alarm bells you know, to the whole nation to say, yes, this is serious. You know, climate action needs to be taken seriously as well. And we are putting in a plan. And therefore, everyone needs to understand this. And I think the top thing, you know, the, the main thing we've got to do is really put in governance into how we deal with climate action. So one, um, from an infrastructure perspective, we've got to make sure that drainage critical infrastructure are protected so that public services, public works are always uh, available to the masses. That's one. Two, um, I shared this with the Asian mayors yesterday that, you know, surprisingly as well, most people don't, may not necessarily notice this, but in Singapore, food security will be an issue too mm -hmm. because we import 90% of our food. Mm -hmm. And if you do have um, climate impact, we do need to make sure that the food sources, food diversification, and even growing our own food. So we do have a plan to grow up to 30% of our food to, by 2030 um, for the purposes of food resilience. So that's something in Singapore you'd realize in 50 years ago we became industrialized and we left agriculture behind. And <laughs> today we're telling people, please make a U-turn and you know, start thinking about urban farming too because that's one area in which we think we can improve um, carbon emission and really be more sustainable. But over the long term, what's also important is making sure that um, your water supplies, your food supplies, and all the basic hygienes are, uh, are well protected and made available, and you have to think for the long term. Otherwise, we would not be keeping the uh, country available or in good, con in, in good place for the next generation. So we are thinking for the generations ahead. I, I just want to add one thing. Zaki brought up a good point about the investment that's going to be made. Um, we all have cards and, and, and sheets, and it talks about all the great things that we're doing in our cities, uh, how we want green industries, net zero, carbon reduction, carbon free, uh, if, and plans. And we all, we're all doing plans. Most cities in this room have really uh, ambitious plans. What we don't have is really ambitious goals of paying for those plans. Yeah. And, and I think that we need to make sure, at least for, in Boston, we've been able to put 10% this year. This year was the first year we did it. Ten percent of our capital spending towards uh, resilient projects, uh, but that's that's the tip of the iceberg. When we talk about these plans we have, they cost hundreds of millions, yes. billions, and trillions of dollars yes. uh, worldwide. We really have to start thinking yes. uh, about this in a bit different a different place as far as investment, because the 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 the, the world, the, the the earth, the environment can't wait. It's not going to wait 50 years for us to come <laughs> let the funding catch up to what we want to do. So that's something I think that we have to do more of uh, finding funding sources and having our national governments and as was mentioned earlier Mike Bloomberg said it unfortunately we have a we have a president of the United States that doesn't believe in this but but we have a Congress that should mm -hmm. and we have a Senate that should mm -hmm. and should be making those larger investments mm -hmm. now good well and we just touched upon yeah I think that's thank you and we just talk, talked about social inequity and, and, and these uh, issues that are clearly a part of this problem. Uh, so, uh, Sheila, um, it's not only an environmental and economic issue, but also, of course, a social issue. So, so how is Spark uh, trying to, to help the most vulnerable communities uh, become more climate resilient and also less vulnerable to climate change? I always thank you. And thank you for inviting me here today. I'm very inspired with all the things that you say. Uh, I've been doing this work for the last 40 years and through the work of my colleagues and other friends, we now have a global network of slum dwellers called the Shack Dwellers International. We have, most, we have almost 50 cities and 33 countries in which we work. 
but we have very few mayors and very few national governments that actually do what they say, which is to call poor people to the table to find solutions. So I've come here to make deals. I want to make deals. Uh, <laughs> In all the global cities, all of you mayors from the south, you know that 30 to 65 percent of people in your cities live informally. We've inherited a, a, a land management system which makes it impossible for poor people to find access to secure land. And poor people have been facing tsunamis for the last 50 years because an eviction is not different from your house being broken by a cyclone or from flooding. And so they are most equipped and most welcoming of exploring solutions that work. And what our organization seeks to do is to create solid, aggregated, long-term organizations of poor people who want to be treated as partners. We don't want to be beneficiaries of some charity that the city will put for us. I want this attitude that you want to protect the big industry and you want to protect the community. That's a very important symbol in action. I was also very fortunate to be one of the commissioners on the Commission on Adaptation. I met so many amazing people there, but I think what we contributed to that process is the urgent need to bring adaptation to the forefront. Because when you put adaptation in the forefront, it gives every individual a chance to make choices of the changes that are needed. We can't only say that our mayors and our government has to produce the change. Every citizen must want to do something that is symbolic. Mm -hmm. And so what we're trying to do is to say, in a very strange way that the things that poor people need, all the SDG goals, and what social justice wants to do in the climate change process, all come together when you look at vulnerable poor people. And so I think, I think it's important for our constituency and our people in our community say, okay, we don't have electricity today. Why should we first get coal-based electricity, then move to solar? Why can't we leapfrog? Why must we build houses with cement with such a big carbon footprint? Why doesn't the industry produce new forms of building materials so that you don't have to strip old houses down and build new ones? So there's a huge opportunity here, especially for all of us who live in the Global South, mm -hmm. to leapfrog in development and to not see climate change as a doom and gloom process, but an amazing opportunity to bring equity and justice and voice to people. So I feel that is really the discussion we should have. Well, thank you very much, thank you. I think it seems like most people agree with you on that point. So Cassia, uh, as a young climate leader, um, so how, how do you think uh, politicians uh, today and young climate leaders uh, together can help uh, shape a better future? Um, thank you, everyone. Um, as Mayor Hidalgo, Greta and others have said before, our house is on fire. And while I'm here, I can help but to think that is not a metaphor anymore. I remember a few months <coughs> ago in August uh, when the smoke from the Amazon together with a cold front made the day turn into uh, evening in Sao Paulo. The signs are everywhere, and we cannot ignore them anymore. Uh, this year, more than ev any time before, young people have been heard and, <coughs> and had been invited to global gatherings like this, and I think it's a good start, but uh, what we advoca advocate as youth climate leaders is that we have to be empowered and given opportunities to take action as key agents and to in the transition to more resilient societies. Uh, so we ask the mayors uh, present here to include youth in the implementation plans that you are presenting today. Not only because we are nice <laughs> and smart, <laughs> but also because uh, as the ones who will face the worst effects of climate change, we bring more ambitious proposals to the table. 
And for example, uh, while government officials in Brazil talk about the intensification of livestock uh, to curb climate change, we are creating new alternatives to meat, uh, such as Impossible Burger and Beyond Meat. And I, I want to thank C40 for the catering. Like, I think you are walking the talk. Like, <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for that. And finally, also, to deliver the future we want, we need to train the younger generations with the professional skills that are needed for the new climate economy. Um, all the, uh, the professions of the future, they will be different from the ones I was trained when I was younger. So uh, a good part of the adaptation plan is to ensure that young people have the skills they need to uh, have like a career that is uh, full of purpose, but also to be agents of, of the change uh, we are looking for. Um, in that way, we can transform a daunting challenge as the climate crisis into opportunities to include millions of young people uh, in new climate careers. Thank you. <clears throat> so I, I can't help uh, wonder if uh, this generational gap uh, in understanding and willingness to act, uh, if that is something that's a problem in its own right, or maybe, uh, you know, isn't it really about time that we erase that generational gap and everybody work together uh, <laughs> towards uh, a better but, future? Of course. Uh, it's not like a, a war between generations, yeah. but I, I feel like uh, with these movements that, that are being led by young people in the last few years, yeah. uh, we are bringing more urgency to the mm. table. Um, as I said, yes. like we will see the impacts. Yes. Yes. Uh, a lot of people are changing the, their future plans. Like There is a, a Brazilian journalist that said that we are seeing the strength of the first generation without hope. Yeah. And that's really true. Like, yeah. uh, I've yeah. been talking to young people yeah worldwide, and they are uh, scared about their future. So what we want to do is to help them to channel this energy into action, mm -hmm. and you need us as well. Thank you. See, now we are not very far from uh, being thrown off the stage, so uh, I, I, maybe we could just briefly, each of, each, each of you, give a, a short vision of what would you think your city would look like uh, in the, for the next generation when, say, uh, 30 years, 40 years, time, whatever. Yeah, sure. It's kind of uh, not very... It's distance yeah. from yeah. the mouth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hello, mm -hmm. test? All right. Um, 30 years from now, 28, 2080. Uh, no, 2050, uh, our, our goal is for carbon neutrality, uh, being carbon neutral by 2050. So you're saying 50 years from now, right? Yeah. 50 years from now. So we'll be 30 years beyond that uh, as a city. Um, our Boston has been growing around 8,000 people a year going into our city. We're at the highest population in 50 years right now in the city. Uh, we're heading towards, in, in the next 50 years, we're probably at maybe the highest population in the history of our city. Uh, we're adding about 20,000 new jobs. Uh, I think 50 years from now, Boston will have more green space. Uh, we will have, um, it'll be a cleaner city. Uh, I, think, I hope that the leaders and the young people at that time who will be the leaders will be able to talk, explain to the younger generation the impacts that were made in 2019, 20, and 21, what happened in the world. I think that that's key. I think I'd like to see the United States back as a leader on environmental justice by the year 2080, I hope. I hope they're there by 2022. Um, <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. Um, but th there, I, I think that you know, green industry, green jobs, green technology uh, will be the leader in the United States and in Boston, Massachusetts, as far as what our economy looks like. Um, I think that all, all signs point to people living longer healthier lives, uh, we want to be able to see that in the city as well. So I, I think, to, to sum it up, I, I think the, the best way I can explain that 50 years from now is that the conversations that we're having today and the effort that's being put in by many of the impre incredible people, uh, including our young people, today in these efforts, is, it, it all doesn't go away. I hope that we can all look back and say that that was a generation uh, that was an amazing generation. And I hope that 50 years after that, people will look back and say that could have been the greatest generation that ever lived uh, in, in, in society as a whole uh, because 
they didn't fight world wars, but they did protect and preserve our planet for, for forever. That's, I think that was a good one. And these have to be very brief. Uh, brief um. Okay, I'm just going to do this. For me, I think before we get to that level, to that state, mm -hmm. there will be that confluence, in fact, transition in which we will be working with the next generation. And I think the conversations has to start now in terms of what kind of future that we want. And it, it, it cannot just be governments trying to envision a future for the next generation. So I fully agree with Cassia that governments need to engage young more and paint that joint vision. But one thing that governments need to do today, and that's where we are very concerned as well in Singapore, is to ensure that the next generation is not unburdened by decisions made today that they could not unwind in future. And to me, that includes, as, as Mayor said earlier, financing, for example, because you put the next generation to debt or you put them in a position that things that should have been done for 100 years are not done, then you realize that they are being embedded with problems they can't solve or they can't finance. So we need to think about how we start um, making us more resource resilient, climate resilient, at the same time as well. Res uh, when I say resource, I mean financial resilient as well. So today's spending has to take into account some of these, whether you use carbon tax, whether you use uh, carbon tax to be plowed back into uh, moving the world towards moving the economy to be more energy efficient or resource efficient or carbon efficient. At the same time, as well, put some measures in place and budgets in place to improve infrastructure, create resiliency. And thirdly, I think as a society, beyond policies, beyond infrastructure, I think we need to embrace that the world needs to be improved and we can do better, both as a people and as a government. So this is where I think the confluence between the generation of today and generation of tomorrow can do better in terms of the conversations that we have and painting that vision together. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And again, we have to, we are running out of time. So. I think we have a very short period of making tough choices. Mm -hmm. First of all, all the cities in the global south are going to grow exponentially. They're not only going to grow exponentially because of internal growth or migration in their own countries. We're going to face a much larger version of migration than what Europe and other northern countries have seen. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be fueled by climate change. So if you, and most of them will end up living in informal settlements. So if we don't sort that problem out now, mm -hmm. it's just going to get worse. The second very important thing is, we talked about youth. In most of the countries in the South, there is a huge percentage of people below the age of 25. So right now, our national governments talk about the youth dividend. I think it'll be a youth disaster if we don't do what you have talked about, uh, produce new, you know, if you, if you learn things that were good in the industrial age, they're not going to be functional now. So how are you going to transform uh, technology, training, investments in order to make that change? And the last thing is that everybody talks about investment needed, but I think you have to start talking about the implications of not making those investments. <laughs> Because that loss will be 10 times more than the debt that you will incur today. So we have a big job ahead. Okay, and Katia, very briefly. Yeah. Thank you. Well, um, I come from Sao Paulo, one of the largest mega cities in the world, and it's estimated that Sao Paulo is already two degrees warmer than 50 years ago, so we are very vulnerable to climate change. And this will exacerbate extreme events such as floods, agriculture, uh, impact, have impact in agriculture, and also in the poor communities. And deforestation in the Amazon might make everything worse, as much of our rain comes from Amazonian flying rivers. In a nutshell, if the Amazon becomes a savanna, Sao Paulo is likely to become a desert. Uh, however, the future I want uh, to build with fellow Brazilians is radically different. I dream of a greater, uh, res greener, resilient, and more just city. 
and powered 100% by green energy with clean rivers, green space, and health and sustainable food for everyone. Oftentimes, we as young people are dismissed as being too idealist, but the truth is that we cannot afford not to change the world in order to secure a thriving future. So next year, in 2020, we are going to celebrate 50 years of the Earth Day, uh, so I hope that I can, by 2070, when we celebrate 100 years, that will be a, a really a celebration and that we will, will be uh, together, maybe some of us <laughs> will, and ce <laughs> celebrating what we achieved and we made uh, the world better than it was coming from. Thank you very much. So <laughs> join me in a applause. Thank you. So join me in an applause for Cassia Moraes, <coughs> Sheila Patel, Saki Mohammed, and Marty Walsh. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Sheila. Thank you so much.